Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, lead pastor here. Also wanted to welcome you and glad you're here. Yeah, we are finishing up. This is the fourth and final week of a series we're doing on relationships out of Song of Solomon. Next week, we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be in, in the book of Esther. Great series start for that next week. Um, so we're wrapping this, this up today, and I was thinking about this. There's this phenomenon, you may not be aware of it. There's a phenomenon that happens when uh, you go to like, like some sort of Christian conference or some, some kind, where it seems like that, that, that pastors my age or, or younger seem to be infatuated with introducing their wives and telling the crowd how hot they think their wife is. Have any of you ever been to anything like our podcast like, and you've experienced that? Well, I'm glad. I'm glad there's no hands or very few hands. It gets really uncomfortable and it's like, and my wife... She's on the front row. She's sitting right over here. And let me tell you, she's hot. And you're like, what is happening right now? And she stands up and she's like, and then like, and then I guess all the other pastors in the room are like, well, man, I don't want my wife to think that I don't think she's hot. So then the next one gets up and starts talking about how hot he thinks his wife is. I'm like, and then, and then if, they, if, they, if they have three or more kids, at some point they'll make a joke about, well, you know, we got a lot of kids and we know where kids grow. I just can't keep my hands off my wife. And you're like, please, please, please stop. And my wife then, if she's with me, she gives me this look. She's like, I'm telling you, um, never, not one time, not, no, no, no. And, and, and so... Um, I, 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 you think, why are you bringing this up? <laughs> so there's this thing that happens um, uh, around our house. And it's, it's, it's just the two of us. And she walks by in such a way that I notice that, again, privately, right? Privately, I think she's hot. And, I, and I'll make some mention of it. Like she's something that she's wearing or something that she's doing just draws attention to me and my eyes, my heart, and I'm like, I really like that. And so I'll say something to her. And then she gives me the look. And, and most wives in here probably are familiar with that look. Certainly the guys are, right? The look that says, seriously, is that what you just said to me? Like, it's like, but, and she gives, me the, she gives me this look. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's true. And then, and then she, just gives, she gives the look again. And, and then what I say to her is like, but just consider the alternative, I know it may be a little bit annoying, but consider the alternative. The alternative is this. Ho-hum, same old wife, same old, same old body, same face, same wife, 25 years, blah, blah, blah. It's like, if those are our only two options, I would think this is the better of the two options, isn't it? And she reluctantly agrees. And, and that, the, the, re- the thing is, as, as, as funny as that is, the, the reality of those two choices seems to be real. And there does, there does seem to be this thing that happens sometimes, not just with a, with, with a guy and his perception of his wife's relative hotness, but just a, a marriage that once had a spark, a, a, maybe a dating or a courtship or engagement in newlywed years. There was, a, there, were, there was a spark, and then there comes this moment where the attitude shifts and it's ho hum same old husband doing the same old thing with the same old job and the same old wife with the same old complaints and the same old everything and all the blah 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 and 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 what once was would have been considered a, a, a great romance has now become blah 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 and so as we wrap this series up we kind of look at little bits and pieces of the last couple of chapters of song of solomon I want to make sure that we're all clear on this big picture idea, which is this, is that we called this the pursuit. And I want you to say this, that, that the pursuit, it, it does not end. It doesn't end. The pursuit, we talk about it. It's not talking about, you know, the, this pursuit of, you know, I want to get th- this person to start dating me. Well, I want this person to, 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 to say yes when I ask them to marry them. I, I, I want to get married and then somehow there's some end date. The pursuit is over. I've now, we, we, I, I was in pursuit, and now I have my spouse, 
So the pursuit is over, and now we just kind of just move from pursuit to life. The pursuit that God is calling us to in our families, and our relationships, that pursuit does not end. So we're going to look at uh, a couple of examples of this over these last couple of chapters. We're going to start in Song of Solomon chapter 7. And it's important here for us to know that some time has passed. At first we were looking, they were dating, then we saw a little bit of their marriage, and we saw a little bit of their, of their, of their wedding night, and then they had a conflict sometime later. This is even more time later. This is at least, it's at least been a year. Most likely it's been, it has been years. And they're just kind of, again, just describing what their relationship's like. And I think it's important. We talked about this when we started this. I mean, it's, it's important for us to understand what a, a very steamy, sensual book God intentionally placed into the Scripture. And He intentionally placed also at the end of this book a statement about what their relationship looked like after the initial season comes to an end. Chapter 7, verse 1. This is, this is Solomon. This is the dude talking. Verse 1, chapter 7. How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Can we just hold up here for a second? Like, in my heart, I want to believe she's pregnant. Because that is the only way in which any of this compliment makes any sense to me. Because if not, he's looking at her. Girl, I'm out looking at your belly, and I think, that's poochie. I like the way it poach. I like it. I mean, that's just, it's just, it's just uncomfortable, but it's a different culture, different time. We'll just, we'll just continue on. And if you'll notice here, if you'll notice here, like if you were here a couple weeks ago, and this was at their wedding night, he was, he was, he was describing the way that she looked. He, he went from head to toe. He started with her hair and kind of worked his way down, got distracted at her chest, and then, and then, and then kept going. This, he's got some new material. He's been married for a while. He's starting at her feet, right? Your feet are like this, and this, but he's working his way up, and of course, we're going to end up here, verse 3. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Okay, but at least he doesn't get distracted like he did before, he, but he, he does come back around to it. Verse 4, your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of Heshbon by the gate of bath Rabbim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head, crown, your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing my love with your delights. And so there's a really good job here. Again, there's been some time. They've been married for a while and you can just tell that he is still, he looks at her, and not head to toe this time, but from toe to head. He looks at her from toe to head and says, you are incredibly beautiful. Everything that I see about you I love. And I have weird metaphors that did not, stand up to generational time. But anyway, all of these things, and, and, I, and I love them about you, and then he, he finishes it off with this. It's not just that um, I, I, I look at you and admire your beauty. He goes to the next level here, as he, as he does. Uh, uh, verse 7, Your stature is like that of the palm, and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree, and I will take hold of its fruit. Now hold up. Some of the um, some of the metaphors don't translate really well. This one, I think, I think we're all pretty clear on that. And some of some of it's like seems like it's written by a great poet, and some of it seems like a twelve year old boy wrote it. Right? It's like, girl, you like a palm tree with fruit, and I'm gonna climb a tree and grab them. And you're like, okay, okay. I, I wasn't an English major, but I get, I get, I get that. Solomon, thank you. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. May the wine go straight to my beloved flowing gently over lips and teeth. And so here we have, again, it's like he, he, he looks at her and describes her with some of the very same words and imagery that he did years ago at their, on, their, on the night of their honeymoon. And his sexual interest in her and his passion for her is as strong as it was years ago on their wedding night. And again, we just have this picture here of his pursuit of her, his love of her, his desire for her is not waned just simply because they got married and they finally had sex for the first time. He is continuing what we will call 
the pursuit. And the pursuit is not a journey from not married to married. The pursuit here, as we describe it, is a depth of knowledge of intimacy about who this person is. I want to know who they are. I want to know their heart. I want them to know my heart. I want us to be close in the closest ways that two people can be. Not simply physically, physically, emotionally, personally, relationally, spiritually. And I want to continue to know and pursue this person and know them as best as I possibly can. But too often what happens is we have this pursuit and you put all of this energy into, I'm going to get this person to go out with me. And, and then I want them to like me enough and I want us to get to know each other and then I want you to want to marry me. And, 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 and it feels a little bit, and again, it's not just a guy in a sexual conquest. It feel, from, from both perspectives, it's a conquest. And then marriage determines that we won, I got the thing, and now we move from pursuit and conquest to marriage. And marriage is routines where it's like, okay, well... We got chores to do, and we 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 clean the house on Saturdays, and we do the laundry on Sundays. And you've got your chores, and you've got your chores. Good job doing your chores. Thanks. Good job doing your chores. Thanks. Who's got the kid? I got the kid. And you want to do that thing that we like tomorrow night? Yeah, sure. That's fine. We can do that. And then, when really. Time and connection should only deepen all of the things, all of the pursuits, all of the intimacy should be pursued by by greater depth of knowledge and understanding of each other. And I will use an uncomfortable metaphor. It's uncomfortable for my kids. I used it a few years ago. I I compared uh, sex like going to Disney World and my daughter's, my older daughter said I ruined Disney World for them. (laughs) It's too bad. It's too bad. We're doing it anyway. Again. So the idea, you know, you think about this like, you know, like going to Disney World is like it can be expensive and it requires a lot of planning and preparation to, to really do it well. And you go there and it's just, it's just crazy, for, at least for, for, for us anyway. You can, you can think what you want. It's, it's, it's an incredible just multi-sensual experience. It's awesome. It's fun. We have a great time. It is this huge, fun experience. And, 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 and we walk away with thinking, we want to do that again. I mean, not necessarily right away, but like, and it, we want to do that again. It's just so, it's so great every time. And, and the way that we do it, and I've, I've talked about this before if you've been around, we don't go to Disney World. We win at it. We win. Like there's 15,000 people in the park, and we want to do it better than anybody. We want to ride more things, experience more stuff, have more fun. And we're, we're trying to win. And, and you go, and it was a, a fun time, and I come back from that, and I think, we won. But you know what we could do? Maybe we could win even better because it's constantly changing and evolving and they're adding new things and they're changing things and, and it's like, I just want to keep winning and I want to win more and I want to win better because the thing itself is so incredible. Why would a relationship be any different than that? It's changing, it's moving. The person is, is becoming somebody different and it's cool and it's better and my first encounter with you was so amazing and I want to have an even deeper, more personal encounter with you. I want to know you better. I want to experience you more. And it's like the knowledge of the person and the time with the person, it builds and deepens intimacy. And if the thing that we're doing in our deepest relationships is making intimacy of any type seem routine, we're missing something. It was never meant to be routine. It, it was meant to be an incredible, multi-sensual experience of, of depth and intimacy and personal relationship. So, how do we avoid that? What are some habits that we need to build in order to uh, keep our marriages and our, and, our, and our deepest relationships from becoming just ho-hum, from boring, where, where the pursuit not only continues, but it gets better and more exciting. So we'll start with this really basic principle, because I think it's probably one of the most uh, clearest definitions for me as far as what, what, what my role in a marriage is defined as. Like, like, what is marriage? What am I supposed to do in a marriage? And it's very simple, and this is what we're called to do, is to give your spouse what they need 
What is my job as a husband? Well, my job as a husband is to give my wife what she needs in the context of a marriage relationship. That's my job. That's what I do. So what is my pursuit? My pursuit is of her and of what she needs and for me to learn and grow each and every day, month and year, to figure out even better what those needs are and how it is that God has uniquely designed me to help meet those needs. That is my job. My job in marriage, my role in marriage, is not to pursue the things that I desire. And I think this is where most marriages get, get wrong fast. You begin to believe that what a, the purpose of any relationship, much less a marriage relationship, the purpose in a relationship is for me to get from you the things I desire. That is selfishness, and that will ultimately ruin any relationship either quickly or with a slow burn. But I am not trying to get from you the things I desire. I'm trying to figure out how God has positioned me to give you the things that you need spiritually, relationally, physically. So in the con- this obviously has a context in marriage. And so what we're going to do is kind of look at it's kind of how that specifically applies to what a husband needs to give his wife in marriage, what she needs to give her husband, and we're going to look a little bit at how um, Solomon and his wife are, are doing that in these passages. So you need to give your spouse what you need. And for her, what that means is cherishing and security. She needs to be cherished and she needs security. To give just some really simple definitions for this, to be cherished means that your, your wife, what she knows without a doubt, is that there is nothing more important in your life to her, more valuable to her than her. There is no habit that you have. There's no job that you have. There's no amount of money. There's no item. There's no other friendship or relationship. There is nothing that is more valuable to you than her. She feels like she is the most valuable person or thing in your life. It's more important than your favorite hobby. It's more important than your favorite sports team. More important than your best friend. More important than you getting to, quote, do the things that you want to do. That in her heart, she knows she's the most valuable. And then security has the idea of that she knows without a doubt that she is relationally safe with you. She is safe when she is with you, and she is also safe in knowing that there is nothing that can happen that will break the trust and the bond of your relationship. You're never going to leave, and that when she is with you, she is totally safe. Now, um, we see Solomon's wife describe this in chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. In verse 5, she's got there's some friends that are speaking that ask her a question, and then she spends the next couple of verses answering that. Chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this coming over, coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? So this, this, is, so this, this picture is of the, they're, they're, they're walking down together, and, and she is, she's, she's leaning on him, and he's, and he's got her, and they're coming towards her. And now she responds. Under the apple tree I roused you. There your mother conceived you. There she who was in labor gave you birth. Place me like a seal over your heart like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. So she's describing what it feels like to be with her husband. She describes it this way. It is like you have a tattoo of me on your chest. And it is permanent. I am permanently right here. I am right here on your arm. There's a tattoo of me on your arm. And it is permanent. In fact, our love really, it's like death. Not the best metaphor in the world, but bear with her here for a second. She's saying it's as unyielding as death. There's never one moment in anyone's life where you should wonder, hmm, I wonder if I'm ever going to die, right? It's like de- death is inevitable. In the same way your love for me is inevitable, there is zero doubt in my mind on any day, on any given moment of my life, that your love for me will be completely and totally there. It, it is unrelenting as death. It's actually, it's like a fire. You can imagine this big fire. And even if the world's greatest rivers overwhelmed this fire with all the water that it had, it would not be able to put that fire out even for one moment. And, and if 
you took our love and someone said, hey, I will give you all of the money that exists in exchange for your love, you would look at it and say, that's a terrible trade. Both of those things, are they're, they're right there. There is no amount of money in the world that I would trade for my continuing relationship with you. That is how cherished, that is how valuable you are. And let me tell you, this is how secure, she's describing this, this is how secure I feel in your relationship. It feels to me like a permanent tattoo. It feels to me like the inevitability of how everyone will ultimately die. It feels to me like a fire that all the water in the world could not put out. She rests in that security and she understands that from his perspective that their, their, that their love for each other is the most valuable thing in the world. So if your wife were to describe your relationship and the security that you bring her, if she were to describe it like a tattoo, how would she describe it? Would it be like a permanent seal that's on her chest? Or would it be like one of those little bitty cartoon things with the, with the washcloth and like, hey, look, baby, I love you. And the next day it starts to, it starts to flake a little bit. But it's still around. I mean, you, you can see some of the, some of the colors. It's still, it's still there. I, I can still kind of remember. I remember where it was. If she were to describe the security that you give her like a fire, would it be a fire that's impossible to put out? Hard to put out? Easy to? When she thinks about the way that her husband has loved her well and the security that she has in him, she describes him with, with, with just incredibly powerful metaphors. And I think it is important for all of us men who are in marriage relationships or men who are considering marriage relationships to consider the power of that metaphor. Is that the level of security that being in a relationship with me brings? She will always know that she is safe with me. So one of the practical, some practical thing that I would just love to say, this is why one of the reasons why it's incredibly important that, 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 that under no circumstances is, the, is the, the word divorce ever used in your home. It is not something to be joked about. It is not something to make an empty or real threat about. It's just not worth it. It just erodes, it erodes trust. And with that, one of the things that my wife liked to say, we said this to many people for many years now, is that you also have to remove what we call divorce code words. Well, what is a divorce code word, you may ask? Thanks for asking, said Charlie. I will gladly tell you. It's when you say things like, I don't know how much more of this I can take. If something doesn't change, I don't know what I'll do. And then if you get called on, it's like, hey, that's one of those divorce threats that that dude talked about the other day. No, 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 it's not like that. All I meant was like, I don't know what we're going to do if things don't change. I don't know how we're going to fix it. It's like, no, that's not what you said. It's an erosion of trust. It is, it is a way of communicating that somehow your commitment to the relationship is unstable. It is uncertain. And it erodes trust. But a guy does it, and he gets a response from it. He can see. He can see the insecurity in her eyes. He can see the, the fear that she feels. And you feel like you've won something. And then you get addicted to it. And then you wonder why she's so insecure and, quote, nags you every time that you leave. You did that. You did that. And I think one of the things that's really important for guys to kind of wake up to is that when your wife expresses some amount of insecurity or what you describe as nagging or whatever, you need to recognize that what you are experiencing is something that you built yourself. Your wife has two buckets. One of them says security. One of them says cherishing. And she's coming to you and say, my buckets are empty. And we will respond to that with criticism and saying that you're nagging me. That is one of the most pathetic, weak things that guys say. You had a job to fill her buckets. She's coming to you with empty buckets. Your response is, I'm sorry. Well, you don't understand how she talks to me. I do understand how she talks to you. Everyone understands. You have to understand that it is your responsibility to do something about it. 
This is a woman crying out to you, sure, possibly in an unhealthy way, even likely in an unhealthy way. But she's crying out to you, saying that you have not filled the bucket that God has placed in my life for you to fill, and you haven't done it. And you take that, and it's most, and, and it's unhealth, and you think, what have I done to make her feel insecure, to feel unvaluable, and what can I do to fill that? That is your responsibility in marriage, and according to her, to hear her describe it, um, he's doing a great job. And every woman is different, every, every, every wife is different, and what particularly you can do to make her feel both those things will be unique to her, and that is what the pursuit is for you. I want to figure it out, and I want to speak her language in the most perfect way so that she can understand that both of those things are overwhelmingly true for my heart, and there will never be a moment when she's not pursued by me. Now, I spent more time, ultimately, by the time the sermon's over, you'll realize I spent more time on that section. It's not because women, men are idiots, though that is true. It is, in fact, because with a woman, it is infinitely, an imminent, it's just infinitely more complicated. But with a guy, it's actually relatively simple. She needs cherishing. She needs security. What he needs is affirmation and sexual responsiveness. Now, there's, it's an elaborate tapestry, and it's very confusing, and it's always moving, and it's, and it's completely complicated how to, a, a guy should pursue his wife and, and, and what she specifically needs in specific moments. And sometimes guys get lost in that complication, and they, and they get discouraged. What I think that women, what they struggle with, is they just can't believe it's as simple as what I'm about to tell you. Here is what your husband needs from you. What he needs from you is you to say, I think you're awesome. Do you want to have the sex? And your response to me is right now, no, 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 he is incredibly more deep and more complex than that. And even what you're saying, I don't know that I completely understand. Can you explain it to me a little bit better? Yes. Man good, sex good too. I like you. I think you're great. And that thing that you said you wanted to do, we should totally do that. That's it. Well, but, but nothing. That. If all you did was that, there's got to be more to it. Even if there is. Do that, and you will be stunned, overwhelmingly surprised by how he responds to that. Verse 10 of chapter 7, I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside, this is her, and let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Now again, you don't have to be a poetry major. Spring is in the air. All the things seem to be budding and growing and blossoming. Let's go there. The mandrakes, it's an aphrodisiac, send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved. Because he has made her feel secure, because she feels overwhelmingly valuable to him, she responds back to him, let's go to the place where the birds and the bees and the flowers and all the things are happening, and I've got old stuff, and I've got new stuff, and let's just go and do the new stuff and the old stuff, me and you. And, and that is what the pursuit continues to look like. And we need to understand, we're talking about a cycle here. The more a woman feels cherished and, and, and secure, the more she's going to want to adm admire you and she's going to respect you. She's going to affirm you and she's going to want to be responsive. And the more you are affirming to your husband, the more he is going to to value you and we have this, this cycle that just builds on which one builds on the next and your responsibility wherever it is you are in that cycle your responsibility is not to wait for your spouse but to do the thing that God has called you to because the, the path to the thing that, that you want is to give your spouse the thing that they need I want to give one small caveat to that if I can guys your wife owes you zero sexual responsiveness if you are making her feel unsafe. That is 100% on you. 
and for you to demand in some way that, you're, that your wife should respond to you sexually when you have made her feel insecure and unsafe, that's gross. Don't ever do it. If that's a problem, that's on you. You need to do whatever you can to make your wife feel safe and secure again. But on the flip side of that, I don't want to say too much. Wives using sex as a, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a tool, as a carrot, as a trick, as whatever, a weapon, that's gross too. We spent eight chapters in four weeks just exploring and talking about the beauty and awesomeness of the love that God wants to create between a man and a woman and how the the sexual intimacy plays into that. And it is a beautiful painting. And we cheapen it by demanding it from our spouse when we haven't done the work. And we cheapen cheapen it by withholding them because we're just not quite seeing the kind of progress that we wish that we could. Because really what God has called you to, wherever, whatever the stage, season, of, of your relationship is to wholeheartedly continue the pursuit. Again, not the pursuit of the things that I desire, but the things that my spouse needs. And I will unconditionally give those and watch God do something beautiful and build a relationship that is worthy of some of the most passionate poetry that the world has ever seen and that God proudly included into His Word. So in your seats, at least in your seat or one next to it or somewhere close by, there's a little sheet of paper. There's a little activity for you. If you are married, take one of those and some activity. Because the only way these things like this are going to get better, conversations, humility, and the power of God moving in your life. So we just got you a little simple tool there that you can use to kind of get some of those conversations started as we move to worship. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for each other for the necessary humility the courage to have these conversations that the power of God would come upon us. Because I promise you, the thing that God is wanting to do in your family is greater and more powerful than you could possibly imagine. And, and, and the road for you can begin today. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for everyone that's here. Again, I know what happens on Sundays like this. There were, there, were, there were too many arguments on the drive over. Too much frustration. Too much distrust. Too much, why are you running late? Too much kids being just a little too crazy. Too much anxiety. And there was every reason in the world for all the people who were here to not be here today. But God, I'm so thankful that you've brought these people here today and the people who will ultimately get to hear it in another context, online or through a podcast or whatever. And God, I pray that in real, tangible ways that you would just touch at the very heart of our relationships. You would help us overcome that pride and selfishness. Your spirit would overwhelm us. We would have the courage to have the conversations we need. And God, we are thankful that we don't have to do this alone that your spirit is with us and that's all possible through your son and his death on the cross for us and it's in his name that we pray amen